Welcome to this week's uh, Wednesday seminar. Uh, really pleased to uh, introduce this presentation. Uh, my name is John Dawson. I'm the branch head for community safety, and I am uh, really uh, pleased to to see a, a seismology talk coming forward. So um, thank you to the speaker for that. Before we start, I might just acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, uh, and acknowledge. Um, their continuing connections to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Um, this morning's presentation will be presented by Tuani Costa de Lima uh, and the topic of the presentation is Signal the Noise Boost of Australia's Small Earthquakes. And essentially um, Tuani is going to talk to us today about the small seismic events that, that often go unnoticed uh, in Australia. The, largely due to the sparse station coverage and um, and the noise of the, of the signal. So through innovative data processing te te techniques that Tony will talk to us about today that really hold the, the, um, uh, the secret to uh, extracting the signal out of the, out of the noise. So this talk will uh, largely focus on seismic array techniques, uh, which really are increasingly playing an important role in understanding subtle seismic signals and how we um, employ these methods to bridge the gaps between our sparse national seismic coverage with the applications that we see in earthquake monitoring, uh, hazard assessment and environmental insights. So Tuani is a geophysicist by education. She moved to Canberra in 2018 to undertake a PhD in seismology at the ANU, driven by her curiosity about the Earth's internal structure. During her PhD, uh, she worked on the implementation of seismological methods to image the Earth's deep interior using global data sets of large earthquakes and performing extensive numerical simulations on supercomputers to understand how the Earth has evolved to its present state. She joined Geoscience Australia in late 2021 and has been working on various projects related to earthquake monitoring, uh, natural hazards and impacts, nuclear monitoring and the National Earthquake Alert set of teams. So please welcome Tuani to the podium. Thank you, John, for this lovely introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the seminar. Um, today, I want to talk to you about uh, one of the key tools that we have in seismology that is used, widely used to improve the uh, the signal to noise ratio uh, improved the signal of small um, seismic events, and it's called array seismology. Um, and I'll talk about its role when it comes to detecting small earthquakes across Australia. Uh, yeah, before I go on, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, um, and, I can, um, and also their continuing connection to land, waters, and community. I pay my respects to the people, the cultures, and the elders past and present. So I would like to start by explaining to you uh, what's the basic principle of a race. So a race means multiple receivers, right? And we can observe it naturally, starting with ourselves. Um, if you consider, for instance, um, a sounds, oh, sorry, a, a source of sound, um, our ears can uh, automatically measure the differential travel times, uh, the intensity, which is the volume of the sound, uh, phase and frequency and other parameters to, to give us a sense of direction. So our brain does this uh, quickly uh, uh, location, uh, so we have uh, we are able to distinguish between speech and background noise, for instance. So it would be a harder task if you have just one ear. And interestingly, in the late 70s, there was a study uh, conducted by this researcher in the um, Department of Biology in the University of Cal in the University uh, in California of California. Um, and basically, um, they found that uh, they studied how the sand scorpions uh, locate their prey. And in this case here, you have a beetle moving in the sand. Um, and as the beetle moves, they cause vibrations. The sand vibrates and this vibration reaches to the legs, the very sensitive, uh, hairy, tiny, tiny hairy legs of the scorpions, and they can promptly locate uh, where the where their prey is. And 
give a step towards it uh, very quickly, less than a second. And um, this is a very, very crucial uh, skill to have once the scorpion doesn't want the prey to go away. So this is a concept that is not only naturally occurring, uh, we also see the concept of a race in medicine, astronomy, but when it comes to seismic or uh, seismology, sorry, we have the seismic arrays, which are basically a combination of multiple sensors um, on the Earth that are used together, at least three sensors of the same time, uh, at the same at the same time, sorry. Um, and seismic arrays, they were primarily designed uh, in the 60s for the purpose of um, um, monitoring of uh, underground nuclear explosions. That's the classical application of seismic arrays. And here we have an illustration of the Yellowknife seismic array, which is one of the oldest seismic arrays that we have deployed. It's in the in Canada. The uh, the triangle over here indicates the location of the array. Um, and if we zoom in, these are the elements, the different seismometers that are deployed in a in a cross shape, in a linear yeah cross shape. And at, not at the same time, but roughly uh, in the same time. Uh, we also have the Waromanga seismic uh, array, which is here in, in Australia. And it's we told it was also deployed back in back in the days for, for monitoring uh, nuclear uh, explosions for this purpose. Um, and it's also one of the best arrays that we have uh, around the globe. So Australia operates not only this, but we have other two permanent seismic arrays um in Alice Spring um and also in Pilbara in Western Australia they do have well you can see that they have different geometries um and this is because seismic arrays are designed for a purpose and the geometry there is the rationale behind the geometry and I hope that I can explain this later on in the talk so here in the middle uh we have uh some of the seismic arrays that are operated by Nor Norsar which is um the Norwegian Seismological Institution. They are pioneers um, in the seismic array techniques. And yeah, they, uh, here we have just a few examples of these arrays um, and they have different uh, different apertures, different sizes. Um, so this brings me to the outline of the talk. Um, I'll start with earthquake basics. So explain to you what causes um, earthquakes, how we measure them, and the construction of the Earth's velocity model, which is crucial for, uh, a for the proper location of, uh, of the seismic event. I'll talk about um, the importance uh, of detecting small earthquakes in Australia, uh, especially when it comes to uh, baseline monitoring for assessment of hazards. Um, and hopefully the third part of my talk, which is uh, where I would like to spend more time talking about is the overcoming the challenges and for that we use seismic arrays and I'll talk a bit about the theory applications advantages limitations and some ongoing work that we're doing and I'll finish up with some key messages so we all know earthquakes the ground shaking uh, of the earth uh, but the dif there are different sources right the different sources that can generate uh, Earthquake. So here we have an earthquake that is caused by the rupture of a fault uh, underground. So when the rocks are under a lot of stress, um, they can just accumulate that stress and at some point they rupture and then the, the, this generates an earthquake. And uh, this is a simple example of, for instance, uh, how the, uh, the borders of tectonic plates work. Just an example. But um, these, there are different sources of earthquakes and they can interact with each other as well. Here I have an illustration of an earthquake that could potentially cause landslides. Um, or for instance, volcanic activity can influence where the earthquakes happen. And they can also be um, human induced. Here is the case of a nuclear explosion um, and this type of, uh, yeah, these nuclear explosions can also cause uh, seismic waves to propagate. Um, so that's an animation that I really like about it's showing the wave propagation from the Sumatra uh, earthquake in 2004. So when we have an earthquake, it releases energy and this energy propagates through the earth. And as it propagates through the earth, it carries information about the medium. It's, it's carrying information about the medium. And if we have 
um, enough receivers on the on the surface, be on land or on the ocean, we can actually come up with, we can record this ground shaking and we can plot them as a time series. And we call this time series seismograms, which are rich, full of information. Uh, and we just have to, as seismologists, our job is to dissect these wiggles. So these are just a few pictures of uh, some field work because of course we have the natural earthquakes, passive uh, seismicity, but we need for, for studying the Earth and uh, yeah, for studying the Earth and other things, we need to, to record the data and we need the stations to be deployed. So this is a type of uh, work that we also do. We go to the field, install receivers, uh, seism, uh, seismic stations, and okay, we have sources, we have receivers, we have everything we need to study the Earth, right? Um, but in order to do that, we need just to understand a bit that the seismic waves, they propagate in different ways through the Earth. They, they have different velocities, they have different characteristics. And for instance, here I have an example of two but say, uh, the seismic body waves, which are P and S. Some of you might be very familiar with it. So the P waves are compression waves that propagate parallel to the um, direction of propagation. So that's the part commotion. And S waves propagate uh, perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And if we have stations deployed uh, around the globe, as we do, we are able to pick these arrivals on the seismograms and plot them on a diagram um, like this. So these dots uh, indicate the arrival timing of these phases, and we can map a wealth of, of seismic phases really in this direct uh, travel time curve. These are called travel time curves. And okay, we have we can sort this as distance from, from the stations, uh, sorry, from the earthquake, which is called the epicenter distance. And okay, we have time, we have distance, then we can come up with the velocity model. And this is the PREM reference model uh, showing how these waveforms, sorry, how the seismic uh, velocity changes with depth. Here in the crust, we have the mantle, we have the outer core, we have the inner core. We are just here in the very first, first uh, interested in the very first kilometers, and uh, really in the skin of the Earth. And this 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 model in particular was constructed using uh, body waves and also normal modes, uh, which is another type of data that I'm not going to talk about here. Uh, but this is important because the construction of a, a an and a, um, a reliable Earth model is important for, for the location uh, of the seismic sources. Okay, so Australia is located in the middle of a tectonic plate over here. This is to the left hand side, we have uh, the location, a map showing the location of the last 60 years of uh, detection of earthquakes. Um, the colors indicate different depths. Um, and as you can see, they really show us the boundary of the tectonic plates over here. Um, indeed, most earthquakes occur uh, on the plate, oh sorry, on the boundaries of the tectonic plates, but they also occur um, within the plates, such, such as uh, here in Australia. So uh, thanks to Trevor Allen for this beautiful animation that I'm about to show you. We do have earthquakes in Australia. Um, the size, the dots indicate the location of these earthquakes uh, over the last 200, uh, 200 years, uh, the color indicating the, um, the year that they happened. And um, eventually we do have large earthquakes. And here are just a few of them that cause uh, financial damage. And um, the, the large earthquakes, yeah, they're, re they're relatively easy to detect. Um, oh, sorry, I would like to yeah, just outline here some of the, <laughs> the significant, uh, dam the, sorry, the cost of some of these earthquakes, what they cost to, to the government updated, uh, normalized to the um, 2022 values. And again, big earthquakes are relatively easier to detect, but what about the smaller earthquakes? So they also are important. We also can learn from that from them. Um, and most importantly, they have huge implication on evaluation of seismic hazards across uh, seismic hazard across the country. So we know that if you go to the website of GA, you'll see this information. On average, um, we have 100 earthquakes of magnitude at least 3.5 recorded across Australia every year. But below that, we 
we're not sure because just of our sparse uh, coverage of seismic stations, we don't really have a proper constraint on, on the smaller earthquakes. So detecting the smaller earthquakes is quite helpful also for, yeah, all related to seismic hazards. This recurrence relationship is really, it's a law, it's a diagram that shows how the number of earthquakes related to the magnitude. So it gives a sense of probability of uh, future earthquakes to happen in that same region. Um, they, their importance in particular to baseline monitoring. Um, here I have just a picture of, you might know, this is uh, the Gorgon project uh, for CCS, uh, carbon capture storage. And um, it is important for us to be able to monitor the seismic activity prior and during this this type of uh, human created uh, this type of activity that is changing the stress in the field and potentially evaluate if the induced seismicity that they are causing is above certain limit level allowed for the environment for other purposes. Um, of course, mining as well and for catalog, uh, catalog sorry, magnitude of completeness, which is we. We hope to lower down the threshold, which is currently 3.5, but this is because, again, larger earthquakes are easier to detect. Um, and also, least, last but not least, we want to know, the population wants to know, so when there is a small earthquake, earthquakes and they call Geoscience Australia, yeah, we want to explain what is going on. So uh, GA operates over 100 uh, high quality uh, seismic stations across Australia, and they are fundamental for monitoring, of course, uh, alerting emergency, emergency services when we have an earthquake, and also for research purposes. And again, uh, GA assures a size of monitoring threshold down to at least 3.5 nationally. Hopefully we'll lower this down in the near future. So at NIAC, we are 24-7 year real-time earthquake monitoring detecting, analyzing, and providing alerting service. Um, we are partners with uh, the Bureau of Meteorology uh, in the Joint Australian Tsunami Warning Center. And you, we can provide, we provide rapid earthquake information, which is available on the website. So please take a look. This is how the uh, room looks like. I don't work there, but I'm sure that geoseismologists will be happy if you come to have a chat. Um, and here to the left-hand side, I have an image uh, of the globe showing an event in Japan and the location of one of our arrays. And this type of event is easily located with the seismic arrays that we have. So I'm going to explain to you a bit more seismic arrays now. So seismic arrays is a comp composition of arrays of the same type that are deployed at the same time for a purpose. Here uh, it's a figure showing the geometry of some of the IMS, which is um, International Monitoring System uh, Seismic Arrays. You have, you see these dots indicate stations or the elements. They come in very different shapes because they suit different purposes. They have different sizes, uh, different sensor types, different interstation distances. You might recognize here what among the seismic station, uh, sorry, seismic, um, um, seismic array in the um, L shape, Alice Spring, which is also part of the um, IMS, and yeah, other other arrays. And basically, the difference um, the difference between a seismic array and a seismic network is basically the techniques that we apply to the data. So sometimes we can use a seismic array as a seismic network. And sometimes we can, you know, we can also use a seismic network as a, actually we can always use a seismic array as a seismic network, but the other way around, yeah, not always, but it's just about the techniques really. And it's based on the coherence. So I'll explain a bit more the coherence for you in a bit. Um, so this is, this is again, just bringing back the map of the arrays, the permanent arrays that we have in Australia. I'm not showing here the temporary ones because they had different purposes for, for research on the lithosphere and yeah, they're not designed for detecting, uh, the small earthquakes, neither these that we have here, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so these two arrays were among and Alice Springs. They are part of the IMS international monitoring system. And here is a map showing some of the arrays that are part of the IMS around the globe. 
Interestingly, they're mostly located in the Northern Hemisphere, but two things that I would like you to remember about seismic arrays. One, they improve the signal to noise ratio of the weak signals, and I'm going to show you in a bit how. And secondly, which is quite important, they resolve the directivity uh, of the source, so they give us a sense of direction, which is something that three component seism uh, seismograms can do, but not always. <laughs> so um, what is the technique? Like all the techniques of seismic arrays are really on the grid search of the speed of the seismic wave and also where they're coming from. So here I have this illustration from Sebastian Ross and Christine Thomas paper of 2002 um, showing um, a sketch of how 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 the waves behave, like how do we approximate them from the real Earth to theory. Um, and it's really simple, basic geometry. You have a source coming from somewhere here, and these are the stations. So as long as we um, assume that we have a pl plane wavefront arriving um, at these stations, we can just correct for the geometry. Um, and this is the site uh, from the top, like from, from above. So you can see here, um, this is the wavefront seen from the top, and the wavefront approximated as a plane arriving, hitting all the stations. Um, so what this is telling us uh, is that for to use the seismic arrays, we we basically do a grid search for for the best velocity uh, because this uh, the angle of the waves coming to the stations, they have an angle. This angle is linked to, to the velocity of the seismic waves and every seismic wave has have their own own velocity, so we can distinguish between them, um, and also the direction. So we compute this time shifts for all the azimuthal directions and all velocities, not all, but in a range of velocities that we expect, and we obtain a map like this. So this is called the beam forming. There are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, you can do in the frequency domain, uh, time domain, but also that's a very simple example of just for you to understand how this works. And what this type of image tells us is that the look uh, where you have more power, like the higher coherence, uh, this indicates where the source is. And this is particularly useful in the case of when we have two events arriving at these stations uh, at the same time, individual seismograms, individual seismic stations, they, they struggle to locate the direction. But once you have an array, and if the if the arrival of the seismic source come at the same time, we are able to distinguish between the two of them because of the direction that this provides to us. Um, so yeah, it improves the location and event association. Um, so an example of random earthquake um, recorded in Oromanga seismic array, uh, the beam forming, which is the st stacking summing summing the data summing smartly the data um, is illustrated here. So here I have um, each of these lines are seismogram for a given station, one of the elements. And you can see pretty clear, right, the arrival of the P waves, which is which you, you have all learned what P waves are. So it's easy for us to just come and pick this information because it's pretty clear. Sorry because it's pretty clear on the seismograms. But just to give you a sense of understanding of how this works, if we just do a plain sum of these waveforms, um, we destroy the signal, of course. It's just not coherent in here because of the way that we are stacking. And there is this offset. Uh, sorry, I, I should have mentioned that these, these waveforms are sorted uh, with distance from the earthquake. So the going down means more distance more distant from the earthquake, and that's why we have the offset uh, over here in time. Um, so what, when we apply the correct grid search for all of the different directions and velocities, and we sum them together, which means we do an alignment of the coherent signal shifting and delaying waveforms in reference to a single waveform, we actually obtain something like this, which is the beam trace. Um, this is a very simple example because you can identify pretty nice arrivals, but I have another example of an aftershock uh, a few years ago um, in Victoria, and these are the individual seismograms recorded by Waramanga single elements over here in blue. 
and it's pretty difficult for for us to identify the the arrival of this aftershock. Of course, it's uh, depending on the frequency that you play around with. Um, but in green line is when we do the beam extraction for the um, correct back azimut and slowness of the arrival. So we, you can increase the detection, like the, it makes it easier for us to, to detect where this earthquake or the signal, seismic signal is coming from. Another example, uh, from seismograms recorded at, sorry, from uh, one of the nuclear tests of North Korea, uh, recorded uh, in Canada, Yellowknife Seismic Array. These are the seismograms um, of the stations. It's pretty hard to tell, okay, where is the, uh, sorry, where is the nuclear explosion over here? But once we do the beam, beam tracing, uh, we do the technique um, for the right location, of course, um, we obtain, I should have put it an animation here, but this is, if you can see here in red is where the earthquake, oh, sorry, the nuclear explosion signal is arriving. On the capabilities and limitations. So our arrays are designed, or among a, was designed for, of course, nuclear monitoring purposes, as we know, but they can also be used for regional and seismic earthquakes. Currently, NIAC is not. They use the seismic, uh, the data from three component seismic stations, but we are currently working on the implementation of seismic arrays uh, as well. And uh, also, the arrays have the capability of uh, imaging the rupture of very large earthquakes that, um, prop that <laughs> sorry, they have the capability of mapping the, the, the propagation, the rupture of these large earthquakes for rapid uh, uh, assessment, which is also not implemented, but can be done. Um, there, there is a signal to noise boost. Uh, we are more, we can in a more reliable way detect these small events uh, using the arrays. We can also do it with individual stations. However, sometimes the signal is pretty low and sometimes you don't have these stations uh, deployed. In near the near the source, um, so the arrays they have this powerful capability of highlighting the signal, allowing us to detect really uh, smaller smaller seismic signals. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the small events can also be evaluated by seismic stations uh, without arrays, but in that case, we would need a really high density network, which we don't currently have, of course, um, and. We also get an improved uh, location information, and this is particularly useful for the um, for how we compute the list of earthquakes in our system, which is automatic. So instead of waiting for five peaks or ten peaks from individual seismograms to send uh, to be associated for the event to be associated um, with a single array, we can we can locate the earthquake just based on the beam, and these. The, the computers can do this automatically for us, so that's an advantage, and particularly useful for early warning, uh, early warning system. A uh, few of the limitations. Oh, so I yeah, there is no such thing as a universal seismic array. This is a phrase from the paper of Steve Gibbons, um, and yeah, that's true. A bit on the limitations, which are really not limitations; they are just things to have in mind before you design an, uh, a seismic array. We need to know exactly which sources we are looking for so we can plan aperture, geometry, the azimuthal coverage that we want to, to cover. Um, so a note, our arrays are relatively moderate to large, moderate sizes and large aperture arrays, they they can give us information, a good, good detection of teleseismic phases. Teleseismic meaning far away, 30 degrees away from us, uh, from from the seismic, from the seismic stations, of course. And it's likely unable, very much unable to process high information, uh, sorry, high frequency uh, phases with the classical beam forming, which means that our current, currently the arrays that we have, they cannot process, uh, give us reliable information on local arrays uh, using the classical beam forming. Of course, there are other techniques that we can apply and other people, other institutions 
work on that using coherence, uh, polarization techniques, which I won't talk about it here. Perhaps that's topic of another talk. Um, but yeah, this, this, just to have in mind, they were not designed for local earthquakes, for detection of local earthquakes. And similarly, the small aperture arrays of just a few kilometers apart, uh, their geometries is usually optimized for the detection and characterization of the high frequency phases, uh, local, local or yeah, very high frequency um, seismic source, but are likely to provide a poor uh, resolution on teleseismic phases that are distant. So our goal would be not would be is <laughs> detecting to detect the smaller earthquakes, uh, especially in areas of that we have sparse seismic stations. Uh, as you have seen, the array techniques can give us fewer detections, which which is not fewer fewer false detections. Yeah, because when you use the seismograms, we have plenty of the algorithm picks many arrivals and many of them are false, but given that array techniques give us the direction and also the velocity, we can more, we can have a more reliable information on, on the location of these events and send them to, the, to be associated. Um, obviously, lowering the magnitude of detection threshold, uh, given that we can improve the quality of the signals uh, of these smaller earthquakes, and as for larger earthquakes, uh, there is, of course, the potential to speed up the association and location processes for, for events, for instance, on our neighbors for earthquake or early warning system, especially when their seismometers are down for any reason. Um, future work that we can do, and probably we should, focus on the design and deployment of mini arrays with good azimuthal coverage, and this is particularly helpful when we want to monitor, monitor uh, seismic activities being induced, human induced, such as hydraulic fracking, uh, the carbon capture storage, which I didn't talk much about it, but uh, I did have a figure in the beginning showing one of the projects. Well, the Gorgon project for CCS, it's pretty much the largest uh, project for this purpose uh, in the world. So we have international attention there in Western Australia. Um, and this type of activity, of course, causes, uh, triggers the stress uh, in the rocks and we do have some, some seismicity. So it would be our interest to, to have seismic arrays that are able to monitor that. Um, and of course, other, other human induced seismicity such as mining, etc. cetera. Um, well, on our website, if you feel an earthquake, please log in uh, and you can fill out uh, I felt this earthquake report. Uh, this is helpful uh, for us. We can come up with a prompt image of uh, the ground of the shake map. So providing us the intensity of how bad uh, the population is being affected and where. So this is in the system. Uh, this has been implemented, I guess, since the 2018, if I'm not wrong, yes. Um, and what I would like you to remember from this talk, uh, of course, I couldn't get too much theoretical details, but the key messages are that we do have un un undetected small earthquakes across Australia. However, we also have powerful techniques in order to discover, not discover them, but to, to detect them. Uh, I have I hope that I have convinced you that uh, seismic array techniques is a powerful uh, tool that we have for earthquake detection, source imaging, and there are many different applications. Um, and we need further advancements in some processing techniques to be able to use the current arrays that we have for different purposes that we want. Um, and yeah, installing new mini arrays to enhance the monitoring of small earthquakes across the country and studying the get get more more knowledge of uh, of our of our land um i'm happy to take questions now and thank you for your attention <laughs>